Okay, it's warm in here, I'm just turning the air conditioning on. Um, okay, last lesson. We looked significantly more in depth at the frames. And I started to teach you more specifically about the postmodern frame because I said it was a little bit more tricky than the other three. But let's see how much you can remember about the other three. So if I was to ask Michaela what the subjective frame is dealing with, could you please tell me? You can't remember. Who can remember? T, can you remember? Is it just the audience? And ours. And the artists as well. Okay. Michaela, okay, you need to go back and revise that this weekend. That's your homework. All right? Um, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural frame. What's that about? Um, the beliefs and values of that particular group. So is a group like has to be a nation or can we typify groups other ways? Okay, so if you see something like that, you know it's in the cultural aspects. Uh, Angelina? Sure. <laughs> Structural frame, what's that dealing with? So it's basically like the shapes and it's like the meaning behind the shapes and the colours and the materials. Okay, so the physical qualities yeah, of the work. Yeah, so it's that the descriptions and how those things have been used. Okay, if any of that information you didn't remember, You've got to go home and you have to practice and actually learn that off by heart. Okay, so last lesson, I've introduced you to postmodernism and I said, hey, this thing is quite confusing. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to get your head around. But once you do, it starts to become a lot easier. So today, we're going to be looking a lot more at postmodernism. And then we're going to see how the other three frames actually come in and often overlap and complement the postmodern frame. Now girls who did, who did art last year, you might see a PowerPoint presentation that looks familiar. Um, you'll just have to bear with it. And there are a few new things that I've put in it that weren't in it last year. So we all know where we're going? All right. Okay. Okay, so postmodernism. What do you notice before we even start talking about, about the pictures that are in this image on this screen? They can look vaguely familiar but a little bit wrong. Yeah, Michaela, what do you notice that looks vaguely familiar but a little bit wrong? The Monet painting, what do you notice about the Monet painting that looks a bit wrong? Um, like the change in the like the and... That's right. So he's appropriated, which means basically to borrow or copy from another artwork. This artist has. His name's Banksy, by the way. And he's making a comment about something. What do you think he's talking about? April. Okay, so he is. He's very much talking about, you know, the Impressionists originally were talking about how beautiful the natural landscape was that surrounds us. And Banks is having a bit of a reality check and saying, you know, using parody and irony. Have a real good look at our, um, our ponds and our lakes and you'll find often shopping trolleys and other debris thrown in there because people really don't look after things like they once did. What about this one? Who does this remind you of? Sorry? Julius Caesar. <laughs> does it remind you of some famous sculpture that you might have known from the past? Who just said that? What did you just say? The statue of David. What's happened to David here? He's a bit overweight. So what's the commentary here about society, Gabby? That um, they're no longer, like, like majority of people aren't always strong because of, like, 
Well, there's a lot of strong people. This is all those gym fanatics. But what is he commenting on? Um, the unfit people in society. <laughs> <laughs> there's a massive issue with the obesity. And often that comes through poor choices in what we eat. Alrighty. So basically, I'm going to run through things and read it to you. Um, I'm not going to insult your intelligence, or maybe I am insulting your intelligence by reading it. But it's more uh, a case of this going to be um, used to reinforce some of the aspects I've already taught you. You don't need to worry too much about copying all these things down. The notes that you take need to be notes that are helping you process the information. Not copying word by word off the screen because I will share this with you. Okay, so you don't have to stress any of those things with me. It will always be shared with you. What is more important is that the notes that you take are helping you actually make sense of the information that I'm delivering to you. Okay? So postmodernism is a contemporary art movement. What do you mean by contemporary? It's modern. If I said modernism, when, when did that take place? It stopped in the 1950s. Started in the 1860s. So contemporary is not modern, as in modernism. It's modern as in today. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. So contemporary is dealing with today's events. Okay, it's usually the last 15 years, but postmodernism we can see was really starting to happen in the late 60s, early 70s, and really kicked into um, quite a lot of artists moving into postmodernism in the 1980s. And you still do see elements of it even up to today. It's very often very controversial. And the reason why it is controversial because it's questioning everything that we hold beloved and dear, whether that's to do with art or society in general. Uh, it breaks down all the boundaries of art. It challenges the audience about what art is and what it can be. And it often draws from several different art traditions. So when we say modernism, that's a big umbrella. And under that big umbrella, we have all these other isms, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Expressionism, Surrealism, Cubism, Futurism, all those isms up until the 1950s essentially are all different art traditions and there's a bunch of them before that as well. And it often, if not always, refers to contemporary culture and that's what's happening now all right or in the last 10 or 15 odd years okay this particular slide here is probably the, the slide you need to know so it's slide number three as your checklist so when you go home and you're having to make reference to an artwork that I might give you and I'm asking you to respond to a question and it's a postmodern question you need to think about this checklist and how many of these things can you see evidence in the artwork itself so we know that it um, challenges the audience with ideas about what art is often using shock as a tactic there's no obvious narrative interpretations are often up to the viewer at times artworks connect with past art styles and they come also from popular art styles. Postmodernists believe that nothing is original. It's all been done before. And that's sort of that whole idea later on that we come down here to the challenging of constructs about the idea of truth and originality. Those things really don't exist, is what the postmodernists are saying. There's multiple and even sometimes contradictory meanings. So, Back here, in the, um, you're trying to work out what the narrative of the artwork is, you're going, it could be about this, and hang on, it could be about that, and they're totally in conflict with one another. What is it about? It's about both those things. Oh, hang on, and it's that too. It's deliberately like that. So if you're looking for just one simple answer, then you've probably missed the multitude of others that are actually contained within the artwork. 
As I said the other day on Tuesday, it challenges the constructs of society. It challenges how we understand gender roles, what our beliefs and values are, and it really pushes the idea of what is actually true and how do we actually make those decisions about what's true and what's not. Stereotypes, this is what it deals with, stereotypes, mass media, comic style images and kitsch. Now kitsch is a German word and it basically is dealing with um, the whole notion of things that are quite ugly and tasteless. But the interesting thing about kitsch things, and we'll have a look at Jeff Koons again later, is that when you go, let me give you an example, when you go to the Royal Easter show and you buy the latest trendy object in um, uh, the show bag alley and everyone's walking around with a ridiculous mask or a ridiculous hat or whatever the case may be and it's the most ugliest thing but everybody's got it and everyone thinks it's really cool. Do you know what I mean? Or you buy a soft toy that is really quite ugly and in and of its own right, but it's cute and it appeals to your emotions. Um, or have you ever been driving down the road and you've seen those Elvis things that rock on the, sorry for the actions, that rock on the, um, on the dashboard or on the um, revision mirror? All that kind of paraphernalia is what we refer to as kitsch. And a lot of postmodern artists have actually gone and found that stuff and I showed you, was it you guys? No, it was the year 10. I showed the year 10 this image by an Aboriginal artist where it's um, Tony Alberts dealing with the misrepresentation of Aboriginal people in all these kitsch images um, from, the from the past and he's gone through all these trash and treasure stores and St Vincent de Paul and actually collected all this kitsch imagery and he's made artworks about it that are very potent in challenging how we perceive and how we represent the Indigenous people of Australia. Um, Non-traditional materials and techniques, often we find them using things. Jeff Coons, who you'll see very soon, made a giant dog, which he called Puppy, out of flowers. Now there's a lot of things going on in that artwork which make it postmodern, which I don't want to actually get into at the moment, but he is not using um, materials that we would traditionally consider art materials. We would normally think of oil paint, bronze, clay, printmaking materials, all that kind of stuff, pencils, things that you would traditionally think of making art with. And he not only doesn't use traditional materials, but we heard the other day in that video that he employs other people to actually make his work. Um, we know that they also are trying to connect their artworks with the meaningful everyday lives of everyday people, not just the people who are interested in art. In art. And they make contemporary culture their subject matter. So it doesn't matter whether or not you're Joe Average on the street or whether or not you're somebody who goes to the gallery or is on the board of directors, everybody should be able to come and look at a postmodernist artwork and be able to unpack something about what the artist is trying to communicate. And often you'll see sceptical and cynical ways of viewing reality, making the audience aware and asking them to consider different um, pers perspectives. And we just saw those cynical views with those last two artworks, one by Banksy when he was appropriating the Monet's um, bridge and uh, Michelangelo's David. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the whole list comes down to these four main points. There are four main devices used by um, postmodern artists appropriation, parody, irony, and satire. The messages in the artworks rel rely on recontextualization. The messages in the artworks are framed by deconstructing society's long-held view and we know that there are many possible narratives or sometimes no narrative. The artwork that we can see here on the screen, what is it referencing? What is the appropriate image first? The Last Supper, thank you. What do we see here? What's the, can you see the people very clearly? What do they look like? They're all teens, yeah. 
and they're girls, except for one. Except for one. So what's the commentary here that we could possibly start to um, unpack looking at this artwork? Mariana, do you know what that could possibly be addressing? Is it because we always see it as like a movie of God and all that as Mali instead of showing everything in perspective? Okay, so what is that actually dealing with? We go back with a whole big list. What what word would you actually utilize just then? Because you're talking about gender. So what what am I? Uh, well, it's a cultural frame, but we're talking about constructs. So you're actually challenging the truth of the construct that is presented in the Last Supper. And what this artist has done is made all the main characters, except for one, who is probably Judas, the male. Everyone else is female. So there then becomes this whole possible interpretation about what they're really saying about contemporary culture, about women, about religion, about a whole range of different things. Okay, let us continue. Okay, what's appropriation? You should be able to tell me off the top of your head. To borrow or to... To copy, thank you. You're basically borrowing or copying um, artworks from the past. So you often will see people stealing artworks from the past. You'll also see them, we saw that with Jeff Koons, that they'll borrow, borrow stuff from advertising. And they'll borrow stuff from the media in general. I mean, you'll often see with artists now, you know, characters from cartoons that have been dropped into their artwork. And it's a commentary about contemporary society. A lot, and often those images are juxtaposed, which means you don't expect to see those things side by side, with something far more traditional. So appropriation is what I'm trying to say here, not just copying artworks of the past, but it's copying or um, sourcing your material from even contemporary everyday society. Here's an example here of appropriation. That's a very obvious connection. We have... Demoiselle d'Avignon, which is the artwork here by Picasso on the right-hand side. And then we have Demoiselle d'Alabama. Demoiselle means the ladies of. So we have the ladies of Avignon here. And we have the ladies of Alabama here. The artist is, obviously the ladies of um, Alabama, uh, is a recontextualization on d'Avignon. And she's relying on um, you knowing the original artwork. Now, the original artwork is quite a controversial artwork, but it's very important historically. This was the very first painting painted of nude women in the canon of art history that actually painted women not as objects of desire and beauty, but actually depicted them as something quite ugly and something completely different to what the traditions of art usually presented them as. When Picasso first showed his friends, even his friends didn't know what to make of it. We've got references here to African masks, and we've got these really pushed back, almost flat figures that are on display. They're all naked. But there's different stuff happening over here in the women of, of Alabama. I want you to have a go at interpreting what the women of Alabama might be about. Different cultures. So we've got 
black women, white women, and possibly a Hispanic woman here. So what are they saying about the women in Alabama, just on a real basic level? It's a multicultural society, quite different to this work here. So what is it possibly saying about contemporary culture? Sorry? Okay, so we live in quite a diverse community now. Uh-oh, someone's phone. Put it on silent. Okay, so we've got quite a diverse community happening here in this very small group of women. What else could it be telling us? Remembering about constructs. Do you know anything about the southern states of America? Do you know anything about America? You watch Donald Trump do his thing? Yeah, they're real good. <laughs> but would you normally see these people interacting together or would they be separated in their com own communities? Okay, we're starting to deal with stereotypes here, aren't we? We're starting to deal with the constructs within society, especially American society. Now, I don't want to spend all day sort of breaking down these artworks, but I'm just trying to sow seeds of how you might go about trying to work out what an artwork is about, just using those headline things that I've been talking to you about. Appropriation, irony, parody, re uh, recontextualization. Hmm? Satire. Constructs. Narratives or no narratives. If you can remember those things whenever you're looking at an artwork, you're going to have some tools, not necessarily all of them, but some tools to start to say, okay, what can I actually work out that this artwork might be about? Okay, we move across to uh, one of the most great artists of the mid 20th century, Andy Warhol, and this is his artwork, Campbell Soup from 1968. Where has he appropriated this from? Where would you find a can of soup? April. Advertisement, maybe? Yeah. Where else might you find it? In the supermarket. Who wouldn't normally see this kind of uh, image? Customers. customers. Are these customers usually the kind of people that would go to an art gallery? No. They're usually housewives going, go, I'm going to do the grocery shopping. We'll have some soup, that'll keep us going on Thursday, and so on and so forth. By taking it out of its normally, normal context of being in, um, uh, in a supermarket or an advertising um, situation, how does it change it by making it really large? So the painting itself would probably be, oh gosh, almost as big as what you see here but turned um, vertically. How would that make it change meaning? What was it saying about Campbell's soup? What's it saying about contemporary life? What's the construct? I'm not telling you, you guys have to start thinking. What do you think? Diana, what's the construct? If it was a bottle of Coke, what would happen to you subjectively looking at this artwork? Sorry? You would be thirsty. So how are you responding to it? You want to go and buy it. You want to go and buy it. So what is that tapping into? Advertising. So here's a bit of an insight. It's not the whole story. It's just a little bit of the story. By taking these things like a can of soup can or a can of Coke or a bottle of Coke from its normal constraints of where we would see it in society and putting it in an art gallery and making it really, really big, he's obviously talking about the constructs of how advertising manipulates and control us to behave in particular ways. Maybe he's asking us to stop and think next time. The other thing is he's actually making a much broader connection with a broader audience to come and enjoy art. Because everybody, if that was a Coke bottle, you guys are all sort of responding much more favorably than you are to the Campbell's soup can. But everyone's drank a bottle of Coke. 
Most people like code, not everyone, but there's some kind of connection with it. Whether you're the President of the United States or Joe Bloggs, who's the wino on the corner of the street, everybody has some kind of story or experience subjectively with the product. Can you see what he's doing? He's actually making art for the masses, for everybody. But he's using advertising techniques to do so. And the other thing about um, Andy Warhol that's important for you to remember is that he comes, he was first trained as a graphic artist and he worked in the advertising industry. So the way that he thinks and uses art is very much, his foundations are very much in his understanding of how the advertising industry operates. Um, a great uh, father of postmodernism is Marcel Duchamp with his fountain. Now, for those of you who don't know much about this artwork, he never made this. It's a found object. Whether he went into a hardware store and found it on the side of the street, we don't know. But he actually picked this thing up, put it on a pedestal, turned it sideways, and called it fountain. Now, we know that there's a whole range of humour in that. So what's the parody of him calling it fountain? So it's about a joke. Sorry? It's a toilet. Sorry? It's a urinal. So when a boy goes to the toilet, it's a bit like a fountain. <laughs> or when they flush the toilet, flush the urinal, it's a bit like a fountain. Or it's, it reminds him of a fountain. I mean, there's a lot of play happening here. There's a lot of, a lot of humour and, and uh, cynicism and he's deliberately provoking his audience. Now this is 1917 that this was made. So it was incredibly outrageous. Even now, um, artists are very careful, well, they're not careful, but they're very much aware of what Duchamp did back here. The reason why Marcel Duchamp is so important is that he is seen by a lot of artists that have come after him as a really pivotal uh, individual in changing the way that artists and the audiences responded to art. And I mentioned this to you the other day. Art up until the time when Duchamp starts to really upset the, the, uh, the, the audiences is really still um, uh, a process where people come into galleries and they're able to be separate from an artwork. They can either choose to engage or, or not engage and move on. But to see something like Fountain in an exhibition, whether you like it or not, you're going to subjectively respond to this artwork. You're either going to be outraged and offended and just want to write something down and have it in the editorial of the local newspaper, or you love it because it's so funny and it's so irreverent. But what he was trying to do was actually to make his audience, no matter what kind of response it was, have a response. And in so having that response, they then move into the next more important phase, which is intellectually trying to work out why, what the artist is doing and more importantly, why. And why did the artist actually call this thing a piece of art? How can it be art? So for Duchamp, it wasn't about displaying, which he did have, these incredible technical skills. He said any monkey can learn how to do that. For him, it was that intellectual engagement, the strategies and games that you could play with an artwork to in involve an audience in the whole process of creativity. Now, it might be interesting to know that Duchamp was also a brilliant chess player. So he used his artworks almost like you know, uh, uh, pieces of a chessboard in the big game of art. He was a very interesting individual. Now, 1917, there's no way he's postmodern. But the ideas that he's playing with and this whole process that he actually introduced, introduces way back in the early 20th century, then become really important. And he's known as the father of postmodernism. This artwork here is by uh, an artist, female artist, Cherie Levine. What do you notice about these two artworks? They're very similar, yes. Can we notice any differences? One's gold. What does gold usually mean? 
luxury, rich, precious. Okay, if I brought you in the into, into class here, I mean, I'd be arrested before this could happen, but if I brought in from, uh, from Paris, from the Louvre, the real Mona Lisa, how would you react if I showed you that this is the real Mona Lisa? What do you think you would do though? <laughs> why, why do I have it? What else would you think? I'm just shocked. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> but would you have a moment where you're like, oh my god, I'm in the same room as Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa? Yeah. 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 I'm, it's like, you know, almost having a brush with a famous person. Like, <laughs> there goes you know, Kim Kardashian or whoever <laughs> happens to be. Whether or not you like her, I saw her. Her fame is somehow rubbing off on us. Do you get what I'm saying? Now these famous artworks are no better than one that's not so famous. Or is it? What? <laughs> what it does actually do is the Mona Lisa is very important art historically speaking because A, Leonardo didn't finish many things that he started. But it's supposed to be an iconic image of portraiture. And then from it, everything else is measured. He was a great scientist, and his painting skills were incredible. So everything is measured against it. And it's considered by the world, especially the art world, as an incredibly precious object. Okay? She's appropriate, she being Cherie Levine, appropriated. Marcel Duchamp's um, fountain. By the way, the original fountain that he made it got lost very soon after he made it because he'd made his comment and the object itself, the artwork, to him was not important. It was the idea. They had to remake it. He actually, in the 1950s, they wanted more copies of it, so they actually had to go back to the original um, designers and get them to make this kind of urinal again so they could make a few copies of it to have them in museums around the world. To make it gold makes it precious again. So what we're seeing here with Cherie Levine is she's saying that what Duchamp actually said here back in 1917 is actually very, very precious and important. But the interesting thing is it's been turned on its side in both cases. Cherie Levine is actually also making a lot of comments here that you may or may not pick up about the whole idea about it being far more useful as a toilet now for a woman than for a man. Because it's not upright. So this is supposed to be at the top and this is at the bottom so that liquid can, can drain out. We could sit on that far easier and, and use it. So making quite an interesting comment there. And of course if it was used, everything would run out here as well. Um, so we've got a whole range of issues, again, dealing with constructs. And this construct here is about gender, about the importance of art, who says something's more important than something else, starts to question a whole range of things. How are we travelling so far? Any questions? Okay, you're yeah, very quiet, so I can take that as that you're just listening very intently and trying to process or it's all going over your head. Which one is it? First one? First one? Okay, you're very intent and listening. Okay. Have, I shown, have you seen this before? Okay. For those who've never seen this before, this is a classic example of appropriation, recontextualization, and an artist being Yasumasa Morimura, the Japanese artist here, really playing with challenging constructs. Okay? Uh, in some case, this artist too, back in 1863, often considered one of the main um, artists who brought in or ushered in modernism, Edvard Manet. Um, this is also, in some ways, an appropriation to another artwork, but you'll learn about that later this year or early next year. This is based on an artwork called, by a Titian called Urban, uh, Venus of Urbino, and this is Manet's Olympia. Now, there's a whole range of subtle things and not so subtle issues involved in Manet's Olympia. I'll just very briefly tell you that 
The genre, which is the um, style of the reclining female nude, the category of the reclining female nude, was whenever you saw these images, and as I said, you'll learn more about it later on, is that these women were actually presented as objects to be gazed upon by a male audience for pleasure. And the women were always presented as demure, submissive, or not even engaging the audience, so that they were basically there on display with all, in, in all their uh, naked glory. Now, you can't see it very clearly on this overhead, or the projector, but there's a black cat here, and then there's a, uh, a black attendant here for this lady who's here. Now, in the traditional images, we didn't have a cat, we had a little dog. And a dog, especially a lap dog, was um, a very well-known symbol of A, wealth, because you had this um, pedigree dog. But dogs also represented fidelity or, lo or loyalty. So whenever you saw these symbols within these artworks, you knew that the female in the work had been somehow kept in such a way and she was loyal to the man for which the painting had been commissioned and created for. The women were always called Venus, Venus being the goddess of beauty and love. And by 1863, we had about 300 years of this, where it was okay in terms of society to paint naked women as objects of desire, as long as they were called Venus. Menahe says what he does is he employs this lady called Victor, uh, Victorine. I can't think what her last name is. I think it's Merol. And she's a very well-known um, uh, art, art um, model. But in this particular work, she's presented as a well-known courtesan, which is a very high-paid, high-class um, prostitute. And we, she's captured in a moment where she's interrupted almost by us, the audience, coming in to interrupt her. She's looking straight back at us. She's not being submissive or demure. She's very much in control of who and who she is and what she's doing. And she's also surrounded by luxury and has an attendant. Now, there's particular things within the work that resonate with the traditions. And the black cat. It's a black cat. A cat, you never own a cat. The cat owns you. Okay? Rather than a dog. You can own a dog. A cat, you can't. Now, there's a whole lot more information that goes with Menet's Olympia, and he calls it Olympia because, again, he's playing with that whole tradition in a really cynical way of how um, artists of the past would use these mythological women and places and connect it to ancient Greece and Rome, and therefore it's okay to have uh, these women there for the pleasure of the gays. Jump ahead into the late 1980s, early 1990s, and we have a Japanese male artist called Yasumasa Morimura, again appropriating a very well-known genre and referencing Olympia by Manet. We've got all these interesting trappings that we can see in the original artwork, but it's very much recontextualized, and it's very much about challenging the constructs of his society and the world's view on different things. I'm going to see how much you can pick up from looking at the picture. April. Um, it's okay. <laughs> what are we learning? It's always correct. As long as you can support it with evidence. That's right. So what do you think? Um, this person on the right, yeah? Looks like a woman, yeah. And switching up the gender roles with the original. Okay, so we've got a play with gender happening here. What else can we unpack? Can you see this? It's a cat. It's a cat. Have a scene. Oh, the lucky cats in Asian restaurants and Asian shops. Have we seen that? Um, those black lucky cats. So a very yeah. direct reference to his culture. culture. Yeah, okay. Can you start to see the overlaps between postmodernism here and the cultural frame? No, so he's bringing his culture to the artwork. That's right. 
What do you see down here? What's he lying on? A which one? Like a Japanese made it up of blankets. Well, it's not a blanket, it's Japanese. It's made out of silk. Yeah, kimono, kimono, kimono. So he's lying on a kimono there. He's obviously a male. He's obviously lying in the same pose as the female in the other shot. What do you think he's commenting on? What's the construct? Is it okay here in Olympia and not okay in Photago? Alison? Because in the Photago one, um, the woman's looking over the man. Like, okay, you see that there's a different sort of power happening here? Yeah. Okay, and how do you see the power change between the attendant and the reclining figure in the man. I don't know. I just see that the woman is taking over. Like okay. Power and just so you see the attendant as female and more powerful than the reclining male nude. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else picking up anything? Gabby? Is he transgender? Aha. Uh -huh. So if he's transgender, what's the construct? April. Um, is it challenging the view of men being an object to that? I'm very bad. I can bring an idea but not elaborate on that. Yet. Well, that's what you've got to work on. Yeah. But you're, you're picking up on these subtle things. So we've got really clear references to this other artwork, but now we're starting to go, hang on, hang on, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. The work by Ed Edvard Manet, and we're going to have to wind this up, we're going to run out of time and, and continue this in a moment. Don't, don't pack up yet. The work of Manet is a very well-known and important artwork based on the canons of art history in the Western world. It's a really important Western artwork. So we've got some kind of reference here by Morimura challenging the construct that Western art is paramount. Who made the West the leader and the best? That's the first question that he's asking by appropriating a Western artwork, and he's done quite a few. The other thing is this whole reference to gender. Again, challenging the constructs of society and who says whether it's wrong or right. All these references here to his Japanese or Asian, Asian um, identity, he's talking about not just his, his sexuality but his identity as a Japanese male. And then within Japanese um, society, cross-dressing is not taboo at all. So there's a whole other story there. The other thing not, nobody picked up is that that's a painting and this is a photograph. And the artist, Morimura, this is a self-portrait and he's in both images. So it's actually been digitally manipulated. So we're getting a whole range of commentary happening where he's both the attendant and he's also the reclining nude form. Can you see how you can keep pulling this artwork apart further and further and further with those headlines that you have about what postmodern characteristics are? Not if you understand, shake your head if you don't. All right, you're going to have to go to your next class, period two. I'll put this onto um, Google Classroom for you and we will continue in a fortnight's time.